but he's not a host. Yeah. Yep. Got it. Okay. 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 I might have been on here. Yeah. Next slide. I'm trying. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, John. So we are recording now. Goodness. Um, there we go. Welcome to Crawford, uh, <laughs> specifically Fruitland Mesa. We live on um, 40 acres and the previous owners created two and a half miles of walking trails. And um, one of the first things that we did was we discovered the Gnome Forest. They had about an eighth of a mile trail with about 20, 22 gnomes hidden throughout. And uh, this little guy greeted us on the north end, or the south end of the gnome trail. I mainly took pictures of um, our immediate area to give everybody a sense of um, how open the sky is. The weather can be rather dramatic. Um, this is my, our view in the morning now. It's towards the east. Those are the West Elk Mountains. I usually get up before dawn and catch the sunrise. Okay. Wow. And uh, this is my new passion this summer was taking pictures of hummingbirds at sunrise as they were uh, having breakfast. This is a morning rainbow that's uh, looking towards the west. It was really amazing. I was uh, putting some laundry in the dryer, happened to look out the laundry room window. I had to grab my camera and run out there real quick. And uh, the amazing thing was, was five minutes later, it was, it was a total downpour that turned into snow. It was really cool. Weather moves pretty quickly through uh, Fruitland Mesa. Wow. That's looking towards um, the north. That's uh, looking towards Grand Mesa. And um, we're, we are in an exceptional drought here in Delta County, which is um, not a good thing. So George likes to take pictures of big things in the sky and I like to take pictures of little things on the ground. That's a globe mallow, scarlet globe, globe mallow. It's about two inches high. Um, uh, it does have some medicinal uses similar to marshmallow. And that was taken in the pasture on the north, our north uh, border there. I just like the way it glowed. Um, earlier this summer, I was going out into the North Pasture, which is owned by a neighbor right around sunset and was finding these little colonies of butterflies on a rabbit brush. They like this one, one particular bush. And this is looking towards um, the east. I think they're just common blues.
I'm showing it. So, is that just a black screen? Yeah. yeah. Oh. Okay. Come up yet? No. no. But Damn. we can move on to George's presentation too. Well, I apologize, Kim. Oh, that's all right. You have them, you can put them in the newsletter and we can share them from there. We could do that. Okay. Let me stop sharing and then um, it's still black. It's not coming back. No. John, you want to try to send them to me and see if I can share them? Um, let's, let's move on to George's. All right. Um, let me stop sharing. Stop sharing. You're not sharing right now. Okay, yeah. George, sure. you got it. Um, I'm going to mute myself and keep myself on, but basically I'm not going to be here. I'm going to go spend time with my family now. So George, take it away. Alrighty. Um, so what I'm uh, about to do involves sharing the screen and running a video that I took uh, early in October, and I'm hoping it goes okay. So um, I just want to introduce what I'm doing. Um, I had uh, I've been speaking with Barb about doing a presentation about how to how I do um, my imaging work, and I was going to do a live um, uh, remote uh, connection to my observatory and run through it all like that. And I thought maybe a safer thing to do would be to just videotape a session that, that I did um, and it's in real time. I, I've got a little bit of preliminary discussion and then I'll start the telescope up and run the imaging, but it really went that smoothly and it, it does most of the time. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and run the video. And then if there are questions, I'm hoping that I'm gonna be able to answer them at the end. So here we go. Are you seeing my um, screen shared? Yep, looks good. Okay, let's see, where are we? All right, here it goes. Hi, this object needs no introduction, but I think I should introduce it anyway. It's Full M31 or the Andromeda Galaxy. It is the fruits of my imaging session that I and presenting tonight. Not bad, I think. I started imaging 10 years ago, roughly, in Pinecliff. I eventually built an observatory because that's what I always wanted to do. It was well built by local builders and di designed by myself. I did build it over my luthier. Shop. We moved to Crawford, Colorado about three years ago. And with the monies left over from the move, I built an, another observatory. Um, it's well built, I think pretty well conceived, but very simple. Also built locally or by local builders. This is, I, I hope, not you guys during my presentation. <laughs> this is the Ghost Nebula. Wonderful object, new one for me. This is the Horsehead Nebula in Hydrogen Alpha. Beautiful, beautiful object. Well, this is where the magic happens. It's my C14 Edge HD uh, upon a um, Paramount MX Plus mount. A little bit of an equipment note. This is a hyperstar. It's a field flattener, an image corrector for the um, 
prime focus of a schmidt kasparin telescope. It has a f ratio of 1.9, very, very, very fast, uh, 670 millimeter focal length. This is a uh, telescope I use for the autoguider. It's a simple 9 by 50 finder scope with a small sensor uh, black and white camera on it. Very sensitive sensor. This is the focuser. It's uh, uh, electronically controlled and very high resolution. It's focusing. Blank. The screen's a couple of blank. Pardon me? Your screen's gone blank. Oh, uh-oh. How about now? Technical difficulties for 45 minutes. That's good. Here. Can you see it? Yes. 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 Okay, I'm going to start uh, a little bit backwards. Um, prime focus of a schmidt kasparin telescope. It has a F ratio of 1.9 very, very, very fast, uh, 670 millimeter focal length. This is a uh, telescope I use for the autoguider. It's a simple 9 by 50 finder scope with a small sensor uh, black and white camera on it. Very sensitive sensor. This is the focuser. It's uh, uh, electronically controlled and very high resolution. It's focusing go fairly easily. A couple of preliminaries. I use real VNC in order to control my remote observatory. I'm sitting on my couch, sometimes watching TV and eating snacks. But everything I need is right at my fingertips. Uh, first thing I do uh, it happens before the imaging session starts and is usually a couple hours before sundown. I turn the fans on my telescope. I also turn the fan on in the observatory. I try and get the uh, temperature equalized or as close to equalized as I can, prevent thermal uh, issues with the equipment inside the telescope. So here we go. During this video, I'm going to go quickly from process to process. I'm going to try and keep the cursor on the area of interest, but sometimes it wanders. Sometimes I get a little bit tied into things that aren't relevant. I'll try and keep on point and I'll try and give you um, a verbal commentary. Prior to each imaging session, I go to my weather computer and I have a peek at what's going on. I've got a nice clear night. This is um, a scene measurement that is actually left over from the prior imaging session. I'll come back to that later. Now I'm opening up the computer on top of the telescope that I'll be using for imaging. I use the Sky Professional. Uh, it's a very nifty program for planetarium, image acquisition, and working the functions of my equipment. Here I am turning on the mount and the USB uh, power equipment. Right now I'm going to open up the shutter and I'm going to home the mount. I want to say a few things about homing the mount. Instead of capturing or synchronizing to stars, this mount has everything needed within it, uh, but only after I run a program called T-Point, which builds a model of the sky. It's an incredibly accurate way to simulate all the errors of the mount. I also have a PEC uh, error uh, model built. So it's homing. It's going to catch up to um, the shutter. And now I'm going to go to uh, my find part. I'm going to look for M31. Just type it in and find it. So now I can do what's called a closed loop slew, which slews to the object, takes a picture of the object, and then um, does what's called plate solving to find where it is in the sky. And then if it's not right where it's supposed to be, it will move the mount 
ever so slightly to put the um, the coordinates that the program picks for M31 right in the center of the image. So my camera will take a picture. It's doing it right now. And once the picture is on the screen, I'm going to try and place the cursor in front or just below a star. Keep a close eye on that. There it is, right there. Um, it's going to take another picture, and after plate solving, it's going to move to where that star should be. You'll notice that it's only a minute distance from where it started out. That means that that mount has a very, very accurate pointing ability. So now I'm going to take another image at about the length of um, my image acquisition for this run. And that just allows me to see where I'm framed, make sure that I like where I'm framed. And then I have a method for um, going from one night to another night by um, plate solving and uh, using the solution that the plate solved from the night before to center my uh, telescope. So this is a, f a 30 second image of M31. It was uh, very nicely placed. Now I'm doing the auto guide routine. First I have to take a picture. Now I'm going to select a star that's not too far to the edge because I don't want any uh, image rotation when I'm auto guiding. So right there, I'm drawing a subframe. I'm going to take another picture. So I'm going to double click on the star. Uh, and this time I'm going to calibrate because I'm a fair ways from where I was last imaging. So what the calibration routine does is it takes a picture, a starting picture, and then it moves the mount in the X direction, which is, I believe, RA. And, and then it takes another picture after it's moved, and then it returns it to its starting point. So that is completed. The uh, X, um, X direction is completed. Now it's going to do it in the Y direction, which is, I believe, declination. So there is the model. I click OK. I double click on the star. And then I hit Auto. Uh, auto guiding. So it's auto guiding now. I create a reticle and the star will be placed right in the center of that. I open up the graphics to, I do that more as um, a way to monitor for major errors. Uh, I don't make any decisions based on the output there, just in case things get really screwed up. On the right is uh, the, the green bar that tells me the um, relative brightness of the auto-guiding telescope's image for a star. I see it's kind of fallen off. It is a little variable, which means I probably have some high clouds moving across the field. It's amazing uh, the amount of imaging, good imaging you could do with high clouds. They're very thin. All right, now I'm in a focusing routine. Um, I'll have more to say about that later, possibly. But what I'm doing is taking a series of pictures uh, in a routine called At Focus 3. It will uh, plot them in a brightness and a proprietary scale. And the object is to create a fairly nice um, distribution and then uh, put the focus steps right in the center of it. So I want to pause there for a second. I, I did not do a very good job describing that. 
really what it does is it defocuses it inside focus and then um, takes uh, samples at um, a defined uh, amount away from where it believes the focus should be, creeps back into where the focus should be, and then does the same thing to the outside of the focus, finds kind of a best fit for it, um, the peak of brightness and that proprietary scale will determine where the actual best focus is. So I'll continue. We're getting, uh, we, we see here that we're a little bit off symmetric. I usually run three iterations of this process. Yeah, we're just a little bit um, on the upside of focus. So I'm going to run another iteration as soon as it lets me. Okay, here I go. So I don't know if you can tell, but it's readjusting the focuser uh, a known amount, and then it starts to take pictures again. I have these uh, bins so that I get a faster uh, a faster readout, so I can do this in just a little under a minute. Uh, if it's not been, it can take a couple of minutes. I have three samples per um, step, which I need for the scene. The scene is not that good to me. So it average, uh, averages out the bad scene. This looks like it's going to be fairly symmetric. Indeed, it's, it's centered right around its expected focus. So I'm going to accept that after it um, <laughs> checks the, uh, uh, the focus point. It gives me a, a full width half max value of 2.2. I don't believe that that actually means anything, uh, to tell you the truth. <laughs> um, I want to clarify that a little bit. Uh, of course, uh, full width half max means something, but in this situation, um, that number is sort of meaningless in telling me if it's focused or not. Um, the smaller that number, the better the focus, but it could be that um, high cloud went through the area. There is a number of things that sort of render it moot um, with this particular process. I will continue. It does, but it doesn't mean anything to me. Now I'm setting up for the image run. I'm saying 45 seconds per image. Uh, I'm going to go 30 images per run. I'm going to add into each run a focus routine. I've been two by two. Um, I specify the filter, but I'm actually not doing anything mechanical there. It's a, a kind of a placeholder. I'm going to do three iterations of each focus. Now I'm just going to duplicate the, um, the 45 second image, 30 of them, put another focus run, and then put another set of 30. Um, so we'll have somewhere around 90 images at the end of the night. So we're almost at a starting point. Again, I don't have a filter wheel. I'm actually imaging at the focus of the telescope using Hyperstar. I'll have more to say about that in a minute. All right, so I'm ready to start. Here I go. All right, so I want to check the first image. Sometimes I check the first couple of images. Um, I'm looking over on the right side of the auto guider. That green bar is telling me that I don't have any obstructions right now. I've got no problems. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about dithering. For me, um, and the, the cursor uh, 
interruption briefly. I'm desperately trying to find the dither um, uh, window and not succeeding. I will eventually, but dithering means that I'm moving the image slightly, um, only a few arc seconds or a couple of pixels after each in image randomly. Um, what this does is it eliminates uh, hot pixels and the need to really do cosmetic hot pixel elimination or cosmic ray um, uh, pixel elimination in the um, calibration step. Yeah, work. Okay. Um, okay, I'm going to go ahead and start playing. The answer is doing some un unnecessary stuff right now. So. Uh, don't pay attention. <laughs> anyway, uh, when I dither, it means that I move the telescope just slightly, you know, a few pixels between every image. And that helps me out when I'm um, processing the image, calibrating the image. It sort of gives me the ability to reject hot pixels yeah, or really aberrant pixels like a cosmic ray. Uh, because the pixels aren't overlaid to each other. So that looks like a pretty good image. Um, I'm ready to start. Or I'm ready to go. Here we go. Oh, I'm, first I'm going to recheck the weather. I like to check the weather about every 10 or 15 minutes. Um, it doesn't hurt anything, but I really don't want to waste time trying to fight with the clouds. So no clouds. That scene screen still hasn't cleared. I'm, I'm going to turn things off now because we're on a roll. That's us waiting for the screen to end. I, um, after a couple of episodes of um, Battlestar Galactica, I'm back. I'm looking at the last image taken. My stars are actually pretty nice in here. Uh, they're not fat. They're not elongated. Uh, the scene's not great. We'll see about that in a second. I'm going to pull up the weather computer and just have a final check. Um, so there are some high clouds, uh, and the scene has gotten a little bit better than I expected, 3.67 arc seconds. Um, I should be at about two and a half to be good scene. So it's about to come to a conclusion. Um, I've turned off the auto guider. I'm closing those windows. I'm closing the picture window. And now I'm going to close the dome. And I'm going to show you that happening. I have a, a camera inside the dome. It always takes a couple of seconds to figure out how to open up. But I want to verify that the dome is closing. If you look uh, where the cursor is, you can see the bottom shutter is closing. And as soon as that's closed, the top shutter will start closing. This is an explorator, Explorer Dome, eight foot dome, made by Polydome. Cheapest thing I could find, works really well. I have automation in it, which is, um, uh, I think, worthwhile. It's not cheap though. Okay, now since the dome is closed, I'm going to park the telescope. I wanna have my eyes on that. Okay, at this point, the dome is safe to walk away from, but I, I still need to close or rotate the dome to the home position, which allows the shutter controller and motor to um, charge the battery. Uh, the contact is on that little uh, rail there that's at the meridian or equator of the dome. I'm gonna try and zoom the camera all right, um, I've got a little bit more video, but um, 
it, it really doesn't show a whole, whole lot more. So what I'm gonna do now is um, go to the slideshow at the end of the, actually I'm gonna go to um, description of the scene monitor. I thought that might be of interest. Um, and then it'll go to a slideshow, I think. Um, and then that will be it. Here's my scene monitor camera. It's a really cool little um, piece of equipment. It's a 100 millimeter telephoto lens with an old QHY uh, camera. And uh, it was from parts laying around. It didn't cost me any money. Software was free. You know, can get that information if you like. This is M31. It's the product of my imaging session with you tonight. This is a stack of calibrated images, about 90 images, all 45 seconds. Um, the only processing really was to dim the center core and highlight the uh, details in the, um, the disk. Uh, I think it's a pretty good image. Thank you guys for your attention. See you later. That's the Wizard Nebula, another ghost nebula. Um, Bode's Nebula and Companion, uh, um, I forget the name of that, sorry. Uh, Dark Cloud and Cepheus, I believe. The Jellyfish Nebula. Uh, the Ghost Nebula, again. And that's the Witch's Head Nebula right next to Rigel. Part of the Veil Nebula. Um, Orion in kind of an offshoot of uh, Hubble palette. A starless heart nebula, soul nebula, crescent nebula, soul nebula without stars again, a different set of colors, the lagoon nebula, um, heart nebula centered on the Malat 15. Part of uh, the Veil Nebula again, the Flaming Star Nebula. Uh, another shot of the Heart Nebula. I was just into that. Uh, the detail in the Malat 15 right here is amazing, I think. Another Crescent Nebula. Elephant Trunk Nebula. Uh, hydrogen Alpha of the flame, Flaming Star Nebula. Another elephant truck nebula, <laughs> the um, Christmas tree nebula, the bubble nebula, um, eagle nebula with the pillars of creation. Uh, just from night before last, the um, California nebula and the comet last summer, nice little rainbow. One of my guitars on sale. <laughs> <laughs> and one of Kim's hummingbirds. That concludes the video. Um, so I'm going to stop share and somehow get back to. Are you seeing it shared still? Nope, you're good. Okay. Yay! 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 Nice. Nice. Great show! Woohoo! <laughs> <laughs> Impressive. Well, thank you. I'm I'm still trying to find a way out of the video. <laughs> well, we okay. We're there. See everybody here. So, okay. Uh, questions, comments, and unbelievable what you're doing there. You know, thank you so much, and I'm so glad this worked. I apologize for. My part of the uh, beginning of this, John and I were trying to coordinate it uh, with him okay. having yeah. a family to deal with there. So um, usually it works smoother at the start. 
but I'm yeah. so glad this part worked and and amazing. So all those ones you ran through at the end, you you've done all this, uh, you know, and, and some of our astro uh, photographers understand this too. But you know, you've done all that processing to get those images you showed us at the end, right? Yeah, um, I will go through my technique on processing in sort of general terms. Um, uh, I, I usually take, well, I take as many subs, subframes or images as I can, depending on what the weather is and what my schedule is like. Um, right now I try to get up to a hundred images um, because of the, the fast nature of the hyperstar, the, the exposures are usually not over five minutes and are usually a minute or a minute and a half. So that allows me to capture a lot of images. Um, I also, at the end of the evening, I didn't show it, but at the end of the evening, I have a, um, uh, a flat panel in the observatory. I slew the telescope to that and take a set of flat, um, um, flat images, which allows me to subtract the um, vignetting and the optical train of the telescope and um, what are called dust donuts. It's how dust appears close up. Um, I also have uh, dark frames. And with a CMOS camera, I'm using what's called a, um, a dark flat image for calibrating the, the noise, uh, the, the register noise out of a CMOS um, instead of the usual bias frames. Um, but those are all stacked um, and processed in a, a, th a routine of pre-processing that I, um, I do with a, a software package called Nebulosity. Um, I'm, I learned on Nebulosity and it goes very easy for me and very quickly. Um, I don't use the, I do have, but I don't use PixInsight, which is really kind of a go-to um, uh, image processing um, software suite. Um, I've just found the learning curve holds me up when I can use Nebulosity and do all the pre-processing and stacking and stretching um, in less than an hour to produce an image. At some point, I do want to learn PixInsight so that I can really draw out everything that, that's there. Um, so after I uh, pre-process, which is the calibration uh, lining and stacking the image. Um, I, I generally um, only stretch the image because in its native form, the example of M31 is really bright and I don't need to really do any stretching with it. It's, it kind of comes out the way it's gonna show in the image. I do need to enhance some details and, and do a, a little bit of work, but with a really dim object like um, the ghost nebula or that dark cloud nebula, uh, it's quite a bit of stretching is needed. Um, so I do um, a nonlinear stretch and then I tighten the uh, stars with a, um, it's like a, um, um, uh, a sharpening process within nebulosity. Um, and that's almost all I do. I take it over to uh, the Macintosh photo editing software, which allows me to get it in a form that I can post a picture of. Um, what else did I want to say? Um, I'll get to filters in a minute. I, that's all I can think of. Um, yeah, I do use, uh, when I, I have two cameras, one is a color camera and the other is a monochrome camera. The monochrome camera comes out when there's a moon out. Um, I use hydrogen alpha 
oxygen three and uh, sulfur two as my narrow band filters. And um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with that, but that's how I draw a lot of nebulosity, a lot of nebula um, details. It also is nice because I can do imaging with nearly a full moon. Um, I don't want the moon close in the sky with the object, but it really filters out a lot of the, the light that the moon renders a lot of images, um, uh, hard to see. The, the reason why, um, why we take a lot of pictures and stack them uh, is not to make additional light apparent, it's to remove or increase the signal to noise ratio of the image. So these are very dim objects. You take a picture of it. The, the data that is nebula is just a little higher than the data that is noise. <laughs> and so what I'm doing is stacking many images, yeah. which removes, or I'm sorry, it increases that, that height above the noise level. Um, I hope that makes sense, but that's really the whole thing behind um, multiple stacking, uh, you know, hours of, uh, or hundreds of images of only two minutes to produce a couple of hours. It really uh, takes the graininess, the, the noise that's in an uh, astro image. A raw George, astro George, what are you trying to get to? Is there something that you're really driven to try to capture uh, that's that you different had. than you haven't done before. Yeah. And you really want to put the whole monte uh, <laughs> of your expertise right on that thing. What is it? Is there something out there that's lurking that you really want to get? <laughs> yeah, I'm secretly waiting to find something hiding behind one of those clouds. <laughs> um, <laughs> You know, I don't know. I, I ask myself that sometimes. Um, I've been fascinated with astronomy all of my life. Um, I wanted to major in it, made it, make it a career, but I found that I couldn't really get past pre-calculus. Um, <laughs> the math gene didn't turn on for me. So, um, and really the reason I got into imaging was I had this, I bought this beautiful telescope. Um, and I was at the eyepiece and a uh, big floater knocked off <laughs> in my eye. And all of a sudden I'm like limited by what I can actually see through the eyepiece. Um, it was kind of temporary, but it really forced me into seeing what I could do with photography. Um, I have done a couple specialized uh, imaging runs. Um, I was driven to look as far back in time as I could. So um, I uh, took some um, pictures of quasars that have uh, a Z, um, a redshift, I believe it's in the 11 range, which still is visible light. It's near infrared, but it's, um, uh, you know, it's like, 11 billion years ago or 11 billion light years away. I might have the, the numbers a little bit wrong there, but the objects were um, somewhere around 11 billion light years away. Um, I've also wanted to resolve Einstein's cross and a couple of the other lensing um, galaxy pictures that are starting to come up on amateur uh, photos. My, my photos, they're kind of average when you compare them to what's being done now out there. Uh, there are some amateur astrophotographers that are producing some amazing pictures. And actually that brings up a, about 10 years ago, maybe I was um, an admin on a Facebook page for stargazing. And I wasn't really experienced in astro imaging and somebody posted a picture of the Orion Nebula with insanely detailed uh, <laughs> pieces of it. And the other admins and I were saying that has to be faked or ripped off. <laughs> and 
professional astronomer. So we kind of blocked it. And um, I think we were wrong in that. <laughs> so um, in any case, I, to answer your question, I really don't know. I'm driven to, to make beautiful pictures when I can. I'm also trying to collect scientific data with those pictures, but I, um, I'm not applying it to anything. Eventually, go back, to, go back to what you were just saying, because I, I find from a reporter standpoint, uh, the word amateur astronomer to me is a, a, a kind of a misnomer. Uh, amateurs, uh, you know, there's so much capability now you folks have. Uh, what do you think uh, when you think of just what you just said about somebody you might have misidentified, you know, what the contribution of these people are. Uh, this is, you know, they got time. They got time in their hands. They got, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, observation time. And I think they're making great contributions. I mean, what's your, what's your take on where this could go? Yeah. Well, I think um, for an amateur astronomer who has a, a pretty good dependable setup, um, and I've been ready to breach this, but I haven't done it because it, it will take some dedication, is um, not necessarily searching, but valid uh, validating exoplanets. Um, there's, um, I forget the abbreviation for it, but it's a variable star organization. And a lot of amateurs are um, documenting very precise um, image brightness profiles. So they're able to see that light curve from an exoplanet crossing in front of its star's um, uh, disk. And so there is a lot of room for, for us to get into that, validating that data. Um, perhaps discovery, I'm not really sure. We, you know, all we have to do is be fortunate enough to point our telescope at something new and find a, um, a light curve that matches an exoplanet. Um, I'm probably missing some other things. You know, there's comet discovery, asteroid discovery. Um, <laughs> I remember uh, one night I was mm -hmm. and I found this symmetric round um, uh, planetary nebula looking thing. And I was really excited. I thought I'd discovered a new object, which does happen. Um, I got, you know, I got its coordinates and I compared it to maps and photographs and nobody else had it. I eventually came to understand it was the uh, reflection of a star image kind of caught in my optics that made it, uh, you know, like a, um, a photograph near the sun, you'll see some optical uh, artifacts. Mm -hmm. But I was very excited about that. Um, I really wouldn't mind find something like that, but uh, it only happens on rare occasions when you're really lucky. Go for it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I'd like to, to say something here. I, Clark Chapman here. I, I, we live uh, about a mile from Pine Cliff as the crows fly, much farther to drive. But, um, oh. but I, I, I'm a semi-retired uh, observational astronomer and uh, was observing up until about a dozen years ago with professional telescopes on Mauna Kea and so on. And, you know, listening to your presentation, you're, you're doing some amazing things that just we weren't doing when we were observing, uh, you know, 20 years ago, dozen years ago. And I, I, I'm, I'm wondering whether what you're doing is enhanced primarily due to the equipment, due to the software that's available to you, due to your expertise and intelligence or the time you have on hand. I, I, I don't think it's predominantly your post-processing, but I just wonder if you'd address, because it's amazing what you uh, presented tonight. 
Well, thank you, Clark. Um, I, you know, I'm reminded of a, you know, what a monkey can do given enough time with a typewriter. <laughs> um, I, you know, it's the equipment. Um, this mount I have will, you know, with the T-point program done correctly, and that's my understanding is that's what professional observatories use to calibrate their telescopes and 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 uh, produce a good model for ops, um, for running the telescope. I'm able to slew within about nine arc seconds from my intended uh, position. There are variabilities to that. For, for a schmidt cassegrain telescope, um, since the primary mirror, mirror moves back and forth on a tube, there's flop and slop in there. And so I'm not able to um, really take advantage of that nine or um, eight arc second accuracy. It may even be greater than that, but um, I get pretty darn close. And when things are running well, um, uh, I, I, you know, the equipment's amazing. The cameras now uh, also, they have almost, no dark current. Um, I'm going to get my terms messed up, um, but the quantum efficiencies are much higher. Some of them are in the 80%, even higher. Uh, you know, you can, but you can spend seventeen thousand dollars on a camera to, to get, you know, a really good piece of equipment. I I pay significantly less for for the equipment that I have, but it's almost it, it was professional grade materials not too long ago. The software, this, um, uh, the um, software BIS, the Sky X Professional has a few um, limitations, but it's really well, well done. There's a bit of a learning curve with it. Um, I've been able to um, surmount most of that learning curve, but I've got a long way to go. Um, the, uh, the real details in uh, astrophotography though, um, you know, there's, you know, exponentially more information and detail mathematics to get to. I was thinking tonight, um, the way I set my exposure lengths are kind of by the seat of my pants. Um, they're not based on the you know, on what my sensor is capable of doing, the sky brightness. Mm -hmm. uh, although I've, I've checked on that, um, it just doesn't make sense for me to do that with every image. I get to where I think I'm going to be good and I see where I'm at. And that's how I get to my exposure times. Does that answer your question? Yes. Yeah, I think uh, kind of. Uh, I it 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 is amazing oh. what you've accomplished. I think, and uh, it's it's beyond what. Of course, I I was observing solar system objects. It's different from doing nebula and so on. But nonetheless, uh, it, you know, you're you are a professional, even if you call yourself an amateur. <laughs> well, thank you. I think the other thing that really makes a big difference, um, too, in his work is. It, we, we live in an incredibly dark sky area. We're, we're probably about five miles from the north room of the Black Canyon of the Gunnison. And um, the sky out here is just simply amazing. You know, Pine Cliff was okay. It was starting to light up though with candle offs. <laughs> yeah. You know, all the other stuff that's going on yeah. there. But this here, it's just, it's just amazing. You know, yeah, we've along. we've been through Crawford and uh, we we know where you are and Pine Cliff is not nearly so good. Yeah. Well, to put a um, a number on it, um, the Bortles rating in Pine Cliff, I believe, is somewhere around five or six out of a zero to ten scale. Um, where I'm at comes in at um, two. So I'm not at the at the darkest, but I'm close to it. I do have a, a light dome from Montrose and actually Gunnison and Delta, but the 
it seems like the level of that is below where I do most of my imaging. But even with with uh, a light polluted sky, there are people with uh, bortles of seven or eight that are producing images of similar quality. They just need to you shorten the image uh, the the individual image durations. <laughs> so you don't oversaturate with sky glow and you take a, a ton more images. And, and so it is possible to image in light polluted sky. But I, I love it being dark. I see the, the dark lanes <laughs> and definitions in the Milky Way that I never knew existed. Wow. So uh, did you move there from Pine Cliff specifically because did you leave us <laughs> here? <laughs> yeah, because of the dark skies, or did you have another reason? That, uh, that was part of that's something I factored into it. I definitely wanted to move somewhere where um, I had a dark sky and I would probably have it for maybe uh, the, the rest of my life. You know? <laughs> for a little while at least yeah. um but there were other things we kind of we spent a lot of our time in in netherland and we both kind of burned out on netherland <laughs> um and um, oh you know, well maybe we shouldn't go there <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you're not you know, clark, clark yeah. and i and i and a few and probably some of the other people here are totally distressed over Gross Reservoir. Yeah. Uh, yes. Getting, they think, Denver water, getting permission to increase the level of, of uh, the reservoir. And uh, Clark and I, and I and Leonard are working, and probably others of you, you should contact us. Um, with still, we're not taking this, you know, uh, we're going to try to fight this. Uh, but, you know, I talked to the guy. He said, yeah, we're going to put lights on the edge of the <laughs> dam. The existing right. dam. Oh, we'll point them down. Because I told yeah. him, we just, we do, we're part of Sky Watchers. Uh, yeah. You know, Art. so we, we need, I'm going to look at, I want to see those lights, what they look like. Do they have a, a shroud over them? But we know we're going to lose light here. So is that partly why you moved over there? Um, yeah. I played into it. Yeah, okay. You know, the Candelas yeah. really, Candelas. in my opinion, destroyed the, the night sky. Yeah. You might be right about that, but, um, yeah. you know, the Arvada and Jefferson County just <clears throat> encroached deeper and deeper into the foothills. And I think they've got a new development at the bottom of the canyon. Yeah. So I've heard about canyon pines canyon pines um and i i was desiring a change of scenery i'm also on oxygen now yeah. um, i found myself when we were moving i found myself uh, hardly able to move without oxygen support so that figured in a little bit um but the road i was on um was basically stupid. It was, um, as you're coming into Pine Cliff from the city, before you get to Pine Cliff, before you get to that um, uh, sharp curve that goes back down into Pine Cliff, I was up that driveway. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's as bad as it looks. Um, <laughs> I, was the, uh, I was the plower on that road. Oh. Guy, oh. Uh, at the back of the road, Michael, who took care of us when we had bad snows, but <laughs> I took care of most of it and I was happy to do it. But I, I, you know, sometimes it was scary and waking up at four in the morning to start plowing was just, I'd had enough of that. So now I get to look forward to maybe plowing a foot on a really, really bad snow. <laughs> on a flat driveway. On a yeah. flat driveway. <laughs> We had about uh, 70 degree degrees today here in November. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah global warming would have brought you back. 
<laughs> yeah, really. yeah, we've been pretty nice too. Um, it won't last forever, though. Yeah. Hey, George. So let me ask you something I, again. That's uh, a little bit on the philosophical white robe thing. <laughs> I mean, you you know, you've just given us some spectacular images. I, you know, somewhere in your psyche, there. I mean, why why do this? What is it that you're interested in i mean what is it you're you're find fascinating i mean this is for a general uh, person on the zoom here uh why do this i mean what what draws you into this cosmos and is there uh you know do you are you want to search are you want to what what are you trying to do there <laughs> Boy, that, origin left. <laughs> um, I, I'm fascinated by the natural world um, and this brings me a little closer to it, it it's you know the, what's out there is really not something I'll ever be tangible with but it gets me a little closer um, the um, uh, the fantasy of a, a photon leading something a million years ago or 10 million or 4,000 years ago and interacting, you know, when I was at the eyepiece, interacting with my eye has always been like a mystic thing. Um, but I guess the bottom line is, you know, I'm just fascinated by the natural world. You know, the, the earthly things are also occasionally fascinating, but more more frustrating than fascinating. <laughs> um, and I, I've just been into astronomy since I was a, a, a young kid. Yeah. I live, I grew up next to Caltech. So yeah. part of that psyche rubbed off on me. Um, just a center of learning and a lot of the things that they were doing. I later got into biology and, you know, ultimately into pharmacy, but yeah. Uh, when I was doing biology, there were some labs at Caltech that were doing uh, just unbelievable stuff. Um, you know, unbelievable scientists like Leroy Hood. You know, that still fascinates me. That's another part of the, the physical, natural world. Um, but my path took me to pharmacy and I became a clinical pharmacist and practiced in Boulder for 30 years and had the opportunity to retire. Um, I picked up the, um, the astronomy bug again and went to town with it. So, so there's a, a where, circuitous way to answer your question, I think. Where in Boulder did you work? Boulder Community Hospital. Really? All right. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, your dad was grinding Pyrex mirrors in Pasadena. Tell us yeah. a little more about, you know, what in, at home? <laughs> or, um, you know, um, the, the, the thing about that is, is I didn't see him grinding. I, 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 uh, I saw his work, you know, I saw the Pyrex mirror blank and the tool and some of his equipment. Um, I asked him about that and he told me he was making a telescope mirror, sort of like uh, there's a book called Amateur Astron or Amateur Telescope Making by Ingalls. Um, I, I picked that up at the library and that's what got me going on that. Hmm. Um, I ground a, a six inch telescope. I, I'm thinking I was like 13 or 12. And then a couple more, I, I finished up on an eight inch, um, which I brought with me to college in Flagstaff, Arizona, which was a nice place to have a telescope. And then I kind of put things down for uh, another, for about 20 years. Um, I picked up, when I moved to Boulder, uh, there was a gentleman here named Ray Martin who had the Martin Star Tracker shop I don't know if any of you guys remember that, mm. but he would, he sold Celestron and me, but he also sh sold um, uh, amateur doohickeys from time to time. 
he had a 10 inch Cassegrain set that I think he had started or he bought from somebody. And we talked and talked about it and I picked it up and he told me about a guy in California, Ed Beck, who would refigure it. Um, so I did that I, uh, and that started me back into astronomy and probably 19, what's that? Oh. <laughs> uh, there he is. <laughs> probably, uh, when was that? 1999 or anyway, it, it was a back of ways, but I had that telescope in Louisville for several years. My most exciting astronomy day was watching the limb of Jupiter rotate into view with um, the little brown black marks from uh, the Levi, what, what comet? Shoemaker yeah. Levy 9. Yeah, Shoemaker, Shoemaker yeah. Levy 9. Yeah, yeah. I, I thought that was the coolest thing I'd ever seen. I got immediately on message boards and <laughs> everybody was just freaking out about that. So, yeah, I don't have a grand scheme of astronomy. I, I really enjoy watching the images um, kind of come to life when I process them, when, when the telescope accepts the uh, photons and they get converted to electrons. I think that's a cool thing. <laughs> so, <laughs> so any nice other questions or comments? Other people have. We have. Um, I got. I got a quick question for you, George. And this is more about trying to figure out how well video playback works with Zoom. Uh, and there were a number of shots in your video that appeared to be uh, panning down, like uh, the picture of the exterior of the observatory and that sort of thing. Uh, were those smooth pans? Because what I saw seemed to jerk about every quarter second or so. Okay. Um, yeah, that was, I have, um, what is it, iMovie? It, you know, it's just the, the movie machine on a Macintosh. So I uh, took a still picture and put it into the video that I was producing. It did that panning piece. It's a smooth <laughs> pan. Um, I think that it's um, perhaps, a, a, you know, a, a internet yeah, uh, network bandwidth kind of thing to show the smooth. Yeah. <laughs> okay. It, it is intended to be smooth. Okay. Okay. That's what I wanted to know. Yeah. All right. Oh. Was the person that purchased your um, observatory um, interested, active of amateur astronomer? Uh, the, the one, the one here. The Ben. He's oh. a musician. He turned it into a studio. <laughs> oh, the our house. The, yeah, yeah. That's part of it, right? Uh, yeah. I, I heard um, from his girlfriend that they were talking about the observatory, so maybe he has plans for it. But mm -hmm. it would have cost me more to remove the dome and put a top on that little room than it costs to build the observatory and buy oh. another. Yeah. Well, you you took the dome uh, with you, didn't you? Oh, really? That's a new dome. That's a new dome. Okay. Exactly the same um, piece of equipment, but okay. it's a new one. Mm. Really? And uh, John Williams, I think, is back on with us here. He bought one of your telescopes, I think. Oh. Yeah, that's the 10 inch Cassegrain pictured by Kim. <laughs> yeah, it's, it sits in my, it's my, it's my new project. I haven't done anything. <laughs> so that optic was beautiful. The, um, I, the quality that Ed Beck did on that set was really remarkable. Mm -hmm. um, plus the scene in Louisville was a lot better than I've seen around. Uh, you know, up in Coal Creek Canyon, the scene is awful. It's <laughs> chronically awful. Just a couple of nights a year, was it any good? Um, and around here, I have a, a diurnal wind pattern that our, our um, I want to call it 
canyon breathes. It, uh, as the temperature change changes, wind comes up and then it goes down. So the scene is not perfect. It's better than it was in Coal Creek, though. <laughs> How did you get to do it? Yeah. yeah. So, uh, John, you're back on here, I think. Um, so, yeah, thank you so much for this. Uh, we have, oh, any other questions or comments? Just as an aside, the difference between an amateur and a professional is who's making money on it. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I sold a print for $80, so I'm making money. Yeah. And let us know if you've got a website, you know, uh, we can send it out to our sky watchers and you know they might what are you what are you selling the prints like you do the prints? Um, I uh, I have from time to time ordered prints and so I have a few around the house we have a friend in Crawford who just opened up um, kind of a gift shop art gallery and so she's got a few of the prints I don't have plans for the prints. Um, that might come later. Um, I'm Maybe sort of- The holidays are coming. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Let us know. Well, if, if you're gonna do that, they could go to your um, Singing Mountain Observatory website. Yeah. If you yeah. wanna do that, or if they wanna- um, I suspect that if I have the the image sitting around that I could make a print from it and I'd want to recover cost and maybe a couple of dollars on the side. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, did you keep all your raw data so you can use uh, updated software to reprocess these things in the future? Yeah, I've, I've got a large collection of um, images but I have one problem. I, I have not done a good job keeping the uh, flat frames for that particular image session with uh, the yeah. collection of images. So I'll, I'll be able to, to do that for some, but not all of them. Okay. Uh, so any other questions, comments? Uh, well, uh, I don't know if uh, Kim and George, oh, well, one Kim, I wanted to ask you, what kind of camera do you have that you're getting these great Earth-based images from? I've got a iPhone 11 Max Pro. Okay. Yeah. So, but, but you're, have you, are all those images from that or have you been, uh, the ones you took and find to us? editing on those you know they're um uh what do i use <laughs> snapseed and i also use photoshop okay yeah but um yeah it, it's it is incredibly beautiful over here yeah and <laughs> your images from over here over on the other side of the <laughs> continental divide yeah. yeah, I I saw those early on, like a year or two ago, and I just that's why we wanted you to share your images too, from Earth to the cosmos. <laughs> <laughs> We're a team. We're a team. <laughs> and these two guys got married in Hawaii a couple years ago, and had some great images from there. Too. Oh, it was it's it'll be a year in April. Yeah, <laughs> really. Well, so thank you so much. And um, I think we're gonna go on to have Dewey uh, show his, uh, it's about nine and a half minutes, not 10, nine and a yeah. half. Uh, um, uh, yeah, it, it, it's, it's a little late now, but if people wanna see yeah. it, I'll go ahead and show it. Um, okay. You know, a couple months ago, uh, Lane Dees was showing some video of him flying around the mountains and we all seem to kind of enjoy that. So mm -hmm. I put together, uh, a little video. I thought rather than trying to narrate it as I showed stuff, I just edited it together into a little nine and a half minute video thing. So kind if like you're interested, I will go ahead and show that. 
Okay. And John, can you, yeah, you might want to stay on it. It's pretty special. Dewey wouldn't let me uh, say much about it, but uh, here we go. Okay, we got it. Oh, back in May of 2016, I attended a fly-in in Melbourne, Florida. This was associated with the Touring Motor Glider Association and was hosted by Jim Lee, the U.S. importer of a particular motor glider called the Phoenix. He was based in Melbourne. At first, what's a motor glider? It's a glider with a motor. Well, as opposed to a regular glider or sailplane that has no motor. And here's a typical low-end glider used for giving lessons. No motor. To fly, it's toned up to altitude by some airplane with a motor. Once high enough, the glider releases the tow rope and the tow plane returns to the airstrip, trailing the tow rope behind it. Meanwhile, the glider just glides. And this kind of glider has a glide ratio of 23 to one. So it can fly 23 feet horizontally for every foot it drops in altitude. Or say 23,000 feet, a little over four miles, for every drop of 1,000 feet in altitude. Now that would all be in perfectly still air. But hopefully, the pilot finds lift from updrafts due to thermals or ridge lift. This is called soaring. Now, here's a much fancier glider. It's made of fiberglass. It might have a glide ratio of 50 to 1. And there's two categories of motor glider. One is a self-launched sailplane. This has a small motor and enough gas or electric battery to get it up a couple thousand feet so that the pilot can then find lift and go soaring. Once up at altitude, the motor folds away so that you have a nice, sleek sailplane. Oh, cool. The point with a self-launch sailplane is that you don't need a tow plane. You can go soaring without any help. But it only has enough motor and gas to get you up to where you can start soaring, and maybe an occasional boost. But it's not intended to fly under power for a long time. A touring motor glider is more like a regular airplane. Bigger motor, more gas. But the wingspan is so large that once you're up at altitude, you can turn off the motor and fly it like a sailplane. But if you want, you can leave the motor running and fly for 900 miles. It has enough gas for that. Okay, so I went to a touring motor glider flying. What's a flying? A fly-in is where a bunch of airplane owners fly their airplanes to a particular airport and spend a couple days socializing, telling tales, and doing activities. One activity is sometimes called the $100 hamburger run. That's where you leave from one airport, fly to another, land there, eat a burger at that airport's restaurant, and then fly back. It's just an excuse to fly somewhere. Well, at this fly-in in Melbourne, there are only about a half dozen motor gliders that showed up. I showed up as a wannabe, hoping I could catch a ride in someone's glider. I lucked out. Jim Lee, the guy hosting the flying, had room in his two-seat Phoenix glider for me. The plan was to take off from Melbourne in the morning and fly down to Duro Beach Airport for lunch, then fly back to Melbourne. But there was a special treat involved. Melbourne is on the east coast of Florida, south of the town of Cocoa which is just south of Cape Canaveral and the Kennedy Space Center. So before heading south to Vero Beach, we would fly north up to the Space Center and we'd get to see it from the air. So here's a picture I took as we were getting close to the Vehicle Assembly Building at the Kennedy Space Center. That's the big recognizable building to the right. Leading to the right from that is the track that would carry the space shuttle and, back in the day, the Saturn rockets for Apollo flights out to the launch pads. Just off the nose of the plane is the Space Shuttle landing strip. And here's the neat treat on this flight. Jim Lee had arranged in advance with the Space Center to get permission for us to fly down the Space Shuttle landing strip at 100 feet above the deck. I have a video of that to show. It's just under two minutes. But these motor gliders don't fly very fast. We're only doing about 75 minutes. So rather than have you sit through five minutes of slow playing video, I've sped the first part up by a factor of two. And please forgive the jerkiness. I was using my GoPro camera held in my hand 
with no viewfinder. So sometimes it bounces around a little. In a low altitude, the air is kind of bumpy. I find it kind of funny that there's a control tower there, but not a lot of traffic on that runway. The Jim City Center is probably the most boring air traffic control job in the country. They're happy to have visitors like us. Okay, let's double the playback speed again to 4X, fast forward the rest of the runway. After getting past the end of the runway, we turn around and head back south. Don't talk to right around Coco. We turn to east to head out over the ocean by Coco Beach. Jim was aware that another one of the gliders in our flight was not far behind us, so he decided to do a 360 to let them pass and then come up alongside them. It looks like their propeller is hardly spinning, but that's just the strobe effect of the video camera. You can rest assured that out over the ocean like this, they had not turned off their motors. Jim does a nice job of formation flying and pull up close. Then he gives them a friendly wave. He banks away to head back toward land. One thing I really liked about that was that they took a photo of us. That's Jim in the white hat, me sitting to his right, holding up my GoPro to shoot the video. And here we are, banking away. From there, we flew south past Patrick Air Force Base, down to Vero Beach. A little more formation flying with one of the other gliders on the way. Now here's a close-up of Jim's Phoenix parked in front of the restaurant at the Vero Beach Airport. And here's an inside photo of the restaurant. The burgers don't actually cost $100, but by the time you add up the cost of flying there, well, hence the term $100 hamburger run. <laughs> After lunch, it was time to fly back up to Melbourne, but there was yet another fun aspect to this flight. Rather than fly straight back to Melbourne, we flew back up to the Kennedy Space Center first. Why? The date was April 8, 2016, and there was a SpaceX Falcon 9 launch heading up to the International Space Station, and we thought that would be a pretty cool thing to watch from the air. <laughs> Unfortunately, we left Vero Beach a little late, weren't quite as close to the launch as we'd have liked, but we could still see it. And I shot some video of it. If you follow this little dot, you'll see it rise up past the horizon. That's the Falcon 9. <laughs> As someone who has seen half a dozen shuttle launches from on base at the Kennedy Space Center, this was none too impressive. But it was still neat knowing what it was, and it was certainly an interesting vantage point. There, you can see it getting above the horizon. Unfortunately, I had been shooting so much video during this fun day that I didn't realize that the battery on my GoPro was just about drained. It managed to last 55 seconds before shutting down. Not as much video of the launch as I would have liked, but given the randomness of it all, I actually feel pretty lucky to get any record of it at all. <laughs> this Falcon 9 successfully landed on a barge out at sea. That was the first successful recovery of a booster from an orbital flight. So it was a significant event. So there you go. Okay.
Yeah, mm -hmm. thanks, Dewey. <laughs> and uh, just so you know, um, even when we have problems with this, Dewey and I got his uh, <laughs> yeah. USB drive uh, yesterday, walked over to his house. You know, we, we went through this this afternoon, and I'm so glad that went well. Uh, uh, well I was going to ask, did, did it play well with the jerkiness? Oh, in the yeah. Did it play oh. smooth? Yeah, it worked well. I think it all flowed. <laughs> hey, wait, when you land on the shuttle, uh, you didn't land on it. You no. flew over it? Yeah. Right. They, they, okay. they allowed us to go down to 100 feet. Yeah. But they said, don't go below 100 feet. Okay. That, oh, that had to make you feel pretty exciting yeah <laughs> <laughs> when i lived in florida uh, i saw one shuttle landing. i saw a number of shuttle launches but i managed to see one shuttle landing um yeah. but that was from you know across the river over on the mainland so you're not up close and of course what happens is it comes down and it disappears behind the trees before it actually touches down but one of the odd things about it was when i would go to a shuttle launch when you get there you know exactly where to look, especially if it, you know you get there at night for the next launch. There's big spotlights and everything all over the launch pad. You know, I'm going to look at the launch pad. But when it's coming into land, you got no idea. There's all these people parked along the causeway to look at it, and oh, I don't know where is it. And then what you notice is you see the contrail of the chase planes, the jets, converging. On it, and as they come together, you go, ah, that's where it'll look. And you get out your binoculars and you go, yep, I see a little black triangle, and then you can follow it as it comes down and lands. Also, I can't remember, but I mean, uh, the the shuttle landing strip is really long. I mean, it's not a normal, uh, yeah. or is it? I, I you know, I, 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 I think mean, it's uh, three miles. Yeah, three miles. I mean, that's a With long. Fifteen thousand feet. Yeah, because you got the shuttle coming in, the parachutes. Uh, it takes a while to slow down there, mm -hmm. but it's pretty unique uh, landing site. So, Kim, you grew up in Florida. Did you see some of those uh, launches? Um, you know, I did not. I grew up on the West Coast, and um, there was one rocket launch. I, I think I must have been at like I don't know, 12, 13, maybe. And my dad worked at a dairy in St. Pete. And um, this was when they just first started making the plastic uh, gallon jars, jugs. And they had a huge tower that was full of the pellets. And we climbed to the top of that and sat on top of that and the launch got canceled. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, as yeah. they often do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Got delayed. Oh, that's that's neat though. <laughs> there was one time when I got to see the uh, space shuttle coming back from having landed in California. So it's you know on top of the 747. Wow. And you know, they're saying in the paper, you know, what time it would be flying up and comes right up the coast, right along the beaches. And my brother and his family were down staying at a condo, a timeshare condo my dad had on Cocoa Beach. And I had my camcorder. I thought, oh, man, I'm going to videotape this. This will be great. But what I didn't realize is that when they tell you what time it's going to be coming back on a big plane, that's not timed the way a launch is. You know, when they say the launch is going to happen at 8.5703, it launches at 8.5703. But when they say the uh, plane's coming back with the space shuttle at eight o'clock, I mean about eight o'clock. And so as it happened, I got there, I got out of my car, I go up to the second floor of the condo, I'm going heading down with my camcorder in my hand and I look up and there it goes. Uh, so uh, I missed the video, but I got to see it. Okay. And it is an amazing thing to see. It looks, it's so big that you think your, your mind says it's smaller, but that the atmosphere is very hazy. When I realize really what it is, is it's that big, but it's that far away, that there's that much atmospheric haze there. So it was kind of a neat thing to see, even if only once. <laughs> yeah, and uh, 
just, I don't know if we've mentioned this before, but Leonard was at the first shuttle landing in um, uh, California. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I was lucky enough tours. to be reporting, and I had a, uh, we actually saw the liftoff of the STS shuttle first launch. Oh, you saw the launch in From the Florida, and then, and then I, flew we flew out there to California. California to see that thing, and of all the people that I met, it was Roy Rogers and uh, Leonard Nimoy, <laughs> and they were all out there, you know, for the, uh, you know, this landing. this landing of the first shuttle, and it was an amazing. Uh, I think the thing that I remember the most is, you know, uh, Crippen, uh, Crippen and Young got pilots? out of the shuttle. Who were the pilots? They were the pilots of the pilots. thing, and right. and for the first one, and they got out there, and, and you know, they were going like. This is it. We're in the space age. You know, this is the we're we're back to something like the Star Trek uh, Enterprise. But it was pretty cool. It was. But Edwards, you know, you're out there at Edwards Air Force Base, and we went out there. Oh God, I don't want to go into this story. Yeah, no, it's a great on. story. Keep it short. Keep I'll it keep short. it short. Please. You please. know the. the uh, <laughs> You know, mm -hmm. nobody knew if the shuttle would survive the reentry. You know, we had missing tiles. We had, the, you know, the whole shuttle uh, saga was really, uh, you know, kind of dicey about what the technology was going to uh, get us to. And uh, that the damn thing comes in over Edwards Air Force Base, and you hear these sonic booms coming in. And we had no idea if the tiles would just fall to the desert yeah. floor or will the shuttle yeah. be there, will the people be alive. It was pretty cool. I mean, it was just an amazing yeah. uh, sight to, to actually uh, be there. And uh, one of my best friends, frankly, is Robert McCall, painter. Bob was up on a, a top of a a trailer painting the whole landing of the shuttle at the time. And he was just up there painting that whole thing and uh, amazing artist. And uh, what a, what a scene to, uh, to uh, feel the shuttle coming back for the first time oh. in uh, history. And, uh, and, uh, <laughs> and I, 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 uh, I guess the main thing I got out of that was like, wow, we pulled this off. Let's mm -hmm. let's move forward. And wow. Like, how many shuttle <laughs> And we had a lot of shuttle flight? flights and we killed 14 people in yeah. the process. Yeah. That's another yeah. story you don't yeah. want to get me on. Yeah. Uh, anyway, yeah. Um, yeah. amazing uh, capability we have there. Uh, but those tiles to reenter were really suspect. Yeah, it was a really gamey thing on that first flight, and uh, wow, worked out. Yeah, it worked out. <laughs> the, thing, the thing I remember from that first landing, watching it on TV, I didn't get to be there. Was that after it rolled to a stop and they opened the doors, Young and Crippen come walking down the stairs like they're getting off an airliner, and then yeah. they're walking around looking at the outside of the shuttle. Like yeah. any pilot who's just landed and he's checking out his airplane, <laughs> yeah. it just seems compared to the idea of you know landing in the ocean and being dumped into a life raft and then hoisted into a helicopter, <laughs> yeah, it just, it seems so different. I had a weird. Uh, I'm going to dr draw this out because it's kind of funny. <laughs> Don't draw. I I drew you know I I went out there really early in the morning at Edwards Air Force Base. And we got out there and we, we talked to the people that had been there for all the test drops and doing stuff. And, and I said, well, where is it coming in? And, he, and the one guy's going, well, it comes in over there and it, it'll come down over there. 
you go talk to another guy, he goes, well, it comes over there. And so you're left with like, where's it coming in? We had no idea. And I just, again, the, the whole tension of the reentry of the shuttle uh, coming into yeah, Edwards first. Air Force Base was pretty tense uh, because we nobody knew at that time whether the shuttle, uh, the tile system, which was, you know, this insane, and I'm talking insane uh, labyrinth of, of heat resistant tiles on the bottom of that thing, would they work? And uh, it was and it pretty out. cool. It worked out, them? but you know, they lost tiles. I mean, there were tiles missing, you know, uh, up in the orbit. Uh, anyway, um, yeah. <laughs> goes on and on, but it was pretty cool. But you're right. Um, you know, uh, uh, young and gripping getting out of that damn thing and getting out of that plane that fast and standing there going, we're, you know, we're, we've done it. You know, we, we were in the future, you know, it was just, you know, and we had the Star Trek crew out there going, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Other than that, it was we cool. can't keep you on too long. Ah, that's enough. <laughs> you know? I, I cool mention, this crap. Anyone else have uh, comments or questions? I, I, I want to mention one thing in connection with that video. It's a question Barb had asked uh, earlier, which was how close could we get to the launch in that plane? And uh, I said we were farther than uh, I hope. I checked, uh, did some looking on Google Earth to compare it to what's in the video. And I think we were about 20 miles away from the launch. But going online and trying to find out what the TFR is, that's a temporary flight restriction uh, in the area of the uh, Space Center is for launches. And I found two references, one that indicated that it's about 30 miles, uh, but that was for a manned launch. And then I saw another reference that makes me think it might have been eight and a half miles. So it might actually be much closer if it's not a manned launch. But I wasn't able to figure that out for sure. I know the pilot knew exactly how close he could get. Yeah. We, we weren't there, but I, trust, uh, I don't recall what the distance was. I trust that was true, but I looked at that too, you know, trying to figure out. Uh, and, you know, if you're a pilot uh, like Wayne um, and you fly in uh, too close, you can get a large fine uh, for, you know, them having to call off the launch. And an escort away. Yeah. What was that? And an escort away. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Maybe some jet flying you. But uh, and Wayne, Wayne is a pilot. Uh, Wayne Dice there, and he flies over our area. And he showed uh, one of his flights, and that sort of inspired Dewey to want to show this. So, you know, before you. Before you close, I just want to thank Barb for all the work she does to put this together for all of us. Yeah. This is such a treat once a month. And I know it's a lot of work. And Barb, we really appreciate you. This one That's was a hard one. <laughs> thank you. Uh, many hours, you know. Uh, and John Williams is a huge help for this. Sure. And, I'm sorry for, you know, John and I were kind of trying to coordinate this at the beginning, and I'm sorry for the glitches we had there. Uh, I'll try to learn. I'm never more. sure Zoom helps you. You know, always uh, do the advanced Zoom. Yeah. Do the uh, Zoom three. But, but why Marion is bringing this up is because I complained to her when they walked by with their dogs yeah. by our house. All right. Yeah. Barb, Barb, the answer is yes, please do the December meeting. Yeah. December meeting. So it would be we'll try. five weeks from tonight. And, you know, some of you may be with flying off somewhere. You know. Uh, probably not to space, but, you know, to family or whatever. But I think whoever we have there at five weeks from tonight, yeah, let's do a meeting and 